Welcome to the webinar. This webinar is sponsored by the Child Passenger Safety and Occupant Protection Healthcare Project at the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems, which is called MIMS. And this is funded by the Maryland Highway Safety Office. I'm Suzanne Ogaitis Jones, and I coordinate this project. Cindy Wright Johnson is the director of the EMS for Children program and um, helps with this program. And she is gonna be our background organizer for this webinar. Okay, in brief, the goals of the webinar are to describe how boosters work to protect children in crashes, contrast their functionality with harness seats, and to share scientific research on boosters. And um, I'm sure other things will come up with boosters. But let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Mansfield is a research assistant professor at the School of, Rehabil of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences of the Ohio State University. She holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Her doctorate degree is in biomedical engineering. Much of her work has involved collaboration with industry representatives within the Center for Child Injury Prevention Studies to develop cutting edge research ideas with results that can be directly translated into industry applications. You may have tuned into the webinar she gave for us in 2018 on rear collisions and the influence of seating positions. That was a wonderful webinar. And if you didn't see it back then, it is archived on our YouTube channel. So you can uh, write to me and I can give you a more specific link for that if you want. But we are just delighted to have her come back and speak with us again and talk about her more current research. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Mansfield. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm looking forward to um, talking about some new booster research, um, some things that are um, already kind of studied and being applied in the field and also some research that's kind of brand new and we're still kind of trying to figure out um, how it fits in and, and what to do with it. So, okay, so first we're gonna discuss what is a booster. Um, traditionally, boosters have looked kind of like the images that you see on the screen here. We have kind of a high back booster or a low back booster and um, their appearance and function is, is pretty straightforward. Um, in today's market, though, we're seeing a lot more different variety of boosters. So we've got three-in-ones or four-in-ones, um, combination seats. We've got inflatable boosters, travel vests, heightless boosters, um, all sorts of different things. And so the things that we're going to discuss today um, have to do with this constantly evolving booster market uh, that we're seeing. So you know, what do we even define as a booster? And what are some of the basic concepts of a booster and how are those concepts maybe changing as the technology evolves? Um, we're also gonna talk about how researchers and or regulators can evaluate all of these different products. You know, what types of questions should we be asking to determine the viability of all these different products? And importantly, um, how can CPSTs navigate um, to help caregivers make the best safety decisions for their children? And so this cartoon kind of illustrates um, how complicated these questions can be. So the teacher is saying, you know, for a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam, climb that tree. And of course, you know, all these different animals are going to have different skills and not all of them are climbing trees. And so the questions I kind of want to think about today are, um, you know, is it fair to judge all of these different safety products by the same booster standards? And, you know, what types of questions should we be asking to you know, at the end of the day, we have to make sure that each product works. Um, but, you know, can we do that in a way that accounts for differences in design or functionality? And are those questions changing from the questions we had to ask before? So, you know, we've been asking the same questions for essentially decades um, in terms of boosters, but do we need to reframe um, what we're asking and how these products are tested and how they're evaluated um, based on the current market and modern vehicle fleet and modern roads because those things all change very, very quickly. So let's go back to the basics um, to kind of kick things off. So at their most basic level, um, boosters work by adjusting the position of the child and or the position of the seat belt to provide optimal protection. Specifically, uh, some ways a booster might do this is to make sure that the shoulder belt is centered over the shoulder so we want to make sure that the shoulder belt is not too close to the neck and that it's not too close to the edge of the shoulder where it's going to slip off the shoulder entirely. 
Um, next, boosters help to adjust the position of the lap belt so that it sits low on the hips or at the tops of the thighs. And this ensures that the lap belt is not too high um, over the child's stomach. Boosters can also help prevent slouching in the vehicle seat. Um, so they help make sure that the child can really sit upright with their backs against the back surface of the vehicle seat or against the back surface of the booster. And one of the ways they do this is by um, effectively shortening the length of the seating surface so that the child um, can sit with their knees comfortably bent over the edge of the booster seat. And lastly, um, a booster should ensure that a child can maintain this good posture and good belt fit for the entire ride. And we know that children love to wiggle and squirm around and they have a little bit more freedom to do that in a booster um, compared to like a five point harness seat. And so it's really important that uh, the booster provides a comfortable seating environment and then that will make the child more likely to stay in a good position for extended periods of time, as opposed to kind of wiggle around to find a position that might be more comfortable for them. So um, traditionally, um, the boosters, um, sorry, the boosted position that traditional boosters um, help children achieve is important because it kind of helps the child achieve a seated height that is more similar to an adult. This um, position really helps the child take advantage of all of the safety features in the vehicle that were um, designed for adults. And so the first one we already talked about, and that is the seat belt. So um, boosters um, in a traditional sense typically help to um, boost the child up so that they um, fit into the seat belt. Um, like I said, it fits across the shoulder, it fits across the hips. Um, seat belts also sometimes have a little bit of addi additional technology built into them. Uh, so sometimes in the rear seat, we see seat belts equipped with pretensioners. And a pretensioner um, essentially helps to remove the slack in the seat belt um, in the instant right before a crash happens. So um, this technology is kind of like an airbag. The vehicle can sense when a crash is about to happen and it fires the pretensioners, which kind of pull the seat belt back and kind of suck up any extra slack in that seat belt before the occupant loads into it. Um, some rear seat seat belts also have load limiters, and this is exactly what it sounds like. It um, kind of prevents the seat belt from exerting too much force during a crash. So as the person loads into the seat belt, um, it kind of provides a little bit of give uh, to make sure that that belt isn't going to you know, stop the person too quickly or too harshly. Most rear seats also have side airbags, um, and this can include several different types. So the most common and most familiar one is the curtain airbag. Uh, its main purpose is to protect the head and prevent the head from striking against the window or the door frame of the rear row. Um, there are also side airbags that protect the torso and the pelvis um, specifically. Um, some rear seats have these, some don't. And um, we're gonna talk about those a little bit more later. Rear seats also have uh, strategically placed padding on the door to protect uh, various different body parts from contacting uh, the metal door frame. And then of course there are head restraints, which we're all familiar with, which support the head in um, rear, Im rear impact scenarios. So spoiler alert, um, despite the fact that children are frequent occupants of the rear row seats, all of these safety features um, are uh, designed to benefit adults and not children. Sorry, my icons got a little messed up there, but these safety features were originally designed to protect adults and not children. And, you know, I do want to note that the current versions of these safety features in the rear seat, um, they don't appear to be dangerous to children. Uh, you know, we all remember that the big, the frontal airbags and the front row seats, we know that those can be dangerous to children, especially the older generation ones from back in the 90s. That's not what we're talking about here. So, Vehicle manufacturers have learned um, from that lesson, and um, all the vehicle safety features um, today are much more thoroughly vetted to make sure that they don't cause harm to children. So I like to harp on the fact a lot that children are not small adults. So, you know, it's really important that manufacturers do their due diligence to ensure that the safety features designed for adults are at the very least not harmful to kids, and ideally, uh, we wanna find a way that those safety features can actually benefit kids too. So manufacturers do consider um, children in side airbag development in the rear seat, and we've got some real world data to support this. 
and um, you know manufacturers even do kind of more extensive testing for children who are what we call out of position for example you know if they're laying down across the seat or if they're leaning with their back against the door um, you know obviously kids shouldn't be sitting like this but it does happen and manufacturers do testing um, with their airbags to see um, and kind of make sure they're not going to cause problems even in those very extreme positions so I don't want to scare anyone these adult design safety features um, do not seem to hurt kids and in fact uh, most can actually benefit um, from them if the child is properly positioned to get that full benefit so one way to do this is using a booster and that booster helps to kind of boost the child up to the height of an adult so that um, they are in a more optimal position to take advantage of all of these vehicle safety features that were designed for adult size occupants so now I want to um, kind of take some time and step through each of these factors um, that boosters affect and um, talk about how we're learning more about each one of these as research and technology uh, progresses. So let's start with how researchers are looking into the fit of the seatbelt specifically. Um, so the first group I want to talk about here is IIHS or the Ins Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Uh, it's a really great organization who has done a lot of work looking at this question. Uh, they've done pretty extensive belt fit studies with boosters and um, you might already be familiar with their booster ratings uh, but if you haven't checked it out please do uh, it's been around for several years now but it's a really great uh, publicly accessible rating system that contains a huge amount of boosters on the u.s market so if you go to ihs's website um, you can see here you can see that they rate each booster into one of four categories they've got best bet which provide good belt fit for typical four to eight year olds in almost any car, minivan, or SUV. Uh, good bet provides acceptable belt fit in most cars, minivans, or SUVs. Check fit um, means that the booster kind of has varied results uh, depending on the child size and the vehicle model. And then not recommended um, indicates that the booster does not uh, typically provide good belt fit and should be avoided. And um, it's important to note that there are currently no boosters on the market with this uh, not recommended designation. So if you click a little further through their website, um, you can see one of my favorite things about IIHS, which is that their entire test protocol and details about their rating systems um, is completely public. Um, so they're very transparent about exactly how each booster is evaluated. And that's really helpful um, to uh, manufacturers who are trying to improve their products and you know kind of follow along and see what they're doing and how they can maybe do some more tests in-house. And it's also really helpful um, to researchers like me who might uh, wanna do similar work or build upon work that's already done. And um, you know, I hope that this is useful to you also so that you know, US technicians kind of understand where these ratings come from and can kind of um, see how to apply them uh, during your seat checks. Um, so I'm gonna kind of walk through IHS's protocol. And this isn't to say that you know, other organizations are not transparent with their methods or don't do as good as job because there are a lot of um, really great groups doing this kind of work today. Um, and it's, you know, useful in different ways. So these are some details I was able to pull for our talk today. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a couple of procedures uh, that IHS uses. So here you can see um, a simplified vehicle seat. This is their test bench where they place each booster that they evaluate. Uh, they show you the exact dimensions of the seat, the angles and everything and they report everything down to the type of um, foam cushion used and even the type and the color of fabric uh, used to cover the cushions. Uh, the seat belt for their test bench is adjustable. A uh, typical seat belt has three anchor points in the vehicle, uh, the outward, outboard anchor point near the seat bite or sometimes down near the floor of the vehicle, and then the inboard anchor point where the belt buckle is, and then the third is the D-ring location or the upper point um, where the shoulder belt retracts into the retractor. Um, all three of these anchor points are at slightly different locations in different vehicles. And so IIHS measures each booster with a range of different belt anchor points to see how the booster can accommodate the range of different seat belt geometries in modern vehicles. For their occupant, IIHS uses a dummy called JASPER, uh, which stands for Juvenile Anthropomorphic Seat Belt Positioned in evaluation rig. Um, you'll notice that Jasper is a pretty simplified version of a child. Um, he's got no arms or legs. Um, he's got one basic height. He's kind of stiff. Um, so he doesn't wiggle around much uh, like a real child. So there are some limitations to doing this, but 
there are also um, several advantages uh, to using this type of simplified dummy. Uh, the first being that he's 3D printed. And this is a huge cost saving strategy because a traditional crash test dummy can run upwards of maybe like $50,000 just for the physical dummy itself. And then if you want to do any actual crash testing with it, the sensors in, that you have to add inside of the dummy might run you another $50,000. So you're talking like $100,000 um, for a full scale crash test dummy. And so 3D printing um, a simplified shape form like Jasper uh, saves you know, tens of thousands of dollars for anyone um, who wants to have one, whether that's a manufacturer or a researcher, um, or maybe you just want one for your home to like hang out in your living room, I don't know. Um, but 3D printing is a way to really save a lot of money um, to, to come up with this similar form that can be used for the same purpose. Um, Jasper also has handy ways to measure uh, how the seat belt fits into each booster that he sits in. Um, he has these little measuring guides printed directly on him, so that makes data collection pretty easy. Uh, the IAHS researchers follow a very detailed procedure to place the booster into the vehicle seat bench, and then another procedure to place and position Jasper inside the booster, and then another procedure to route the seat belt through the belt guides and over Jasper. And they do this in a very um, documented and repeatable way so that anybody can get kind of the same results um, following their procedures. Um, but this custom designing him to do this job is really beneficial in a lot of ways. So using these tools, IHS collects a few main metrics from each booster. Uh, they look at the shoulder belt score or SBS, which shows where the shoulder belt crosses over the shoulder area of Jasper. The ratings uh, in the green area are good, yellow is marginal, and then red shows areas where the belt is either too far out on the shoulder or too close to the neck. A similar scale is used for the lap belt score or LBS. Uh, the ideal region is marked in green, and then the yellow and red show belt fits that are either too high on the abdomen or too far forward on the thighs. And they also look at fore aft distance um, at a reference point on the upper chest. And so this is to see if the belt fits um, snugly against the chest or if the belt is kind of floating in front of the chest with a gap uh, between the belt and the torso. So these items combined allow IHS to come up with their rating categories for each booster. Uh, their search system is very easy. So you can go to their website and type in the name of any booster and the results come up. Here I just typed in Graco and it started listing all the Graco seats uh, with the forever first and you can see the rating results here in green, uh, both best bets for the, the two different versions of the forever that came up. So IHS is just one example of a company and researchers doing some of the groundwork of evaluating boosters and finding areas that might need improvement. Um, Consumer Reports is another really fantastic resource for CRS and booster evaluations. Uh, their protocol is a little bit more extensive, so I'm just going to give you a quick summary of it here. Uh, they install each booster into five different vehicles. So they're using actual vehicles instead of a simplified test bench. And that is how they get kind of a, vari a variety of different seat types and belt geometries to test. Consumer Report um, also does what they call a movement test. So they wiggle the dummy around in the booster to see if the belt stays in its proper position during normal movement of the child occupant because you know, we all know that kids love to wiggle and squirm. Um, so that's kind of why they factor in those, those tests. Consumer Reports also factors in um, the usability um, and ease of use evaluations. So uh, they evaluate how easy the booster is to use and buckle. And then they also look at the booster's labeling and instructions to see how straightforward or confusing those are. And lastly, importantly, uh, Consumer Reports does their own crash testing of each booster. So they include that dynamic safety component in their evaluations. So this is a really nice, well-rounded um, evaluation protocol that contains several different aspects of booster usability and performance. Um, and then you can check out the website and the post by Consumer Reports explaining their results and summaries. Um, the full detailed ratings for each booster are behind a paywall, so you need to be a member of Consumer Reports to access um, all the details, but they do um, provide some nice summaries for free, listing some of their top picks in the various uh, different booster categories. 
So those are some of the ways um, that different companies are evaluating boosters and that information is really useful um, to a lot of people. It's useful to manufacturers who can see how their products are doing um, according to these third-party evaluations. And the information is also really valuable to other researchers who might need to maybe select a small sample of boosters to do a specific study on. And maybe we want to get kind of a good representative selection of the entire market. So having all of these data available for virtual, virtually every booster on the market is really, really helpful. Um, but what about you know, CPSTs and what about the caregivers that you all educate? Um, you know, I think we've all had caregivers or even friends and family ask us, which booster should I buy? Which one is the best one? And as technicians, uh, we know that the only correct answer to this question is the best booster is the one that fits the vehicle, fits the child, and will be used correctly for every single trip. And this really is true. It's the best overall advice that we can give caregivers. Um, but that being said, you know, I think sometimes this line can be a little frustrating to caregivers because they don't know which booster will fit their child best or fit their car best. And they're looking for more specific guidance. Um, so, you know, this is definitely something we should tell caregivers, but don't just leave it at this. We need to kind of dig a little bit deeper and help them find a booster uh, that might be a good match for them. So if nothing else, um, a booster, a properly fitting booster will meet these three main checkpoints. It will ensure that the seat belt crosses over the center of the shoulder, ensure that the lap belt sits low on the hips, and ensures that the child can stay properly positioned for the entire ride, uh, meaning that they are comfortable in their posture and their arms and legs and head all fit comfortably where they are supposed to fit. So shoulder, hips, entire ride. Uh, these are kind of three specific checks that a caregiver can do just by looking at their child or a technician can help with and, you know, it really kind of boils it down so that the caregiver doesn't get overwhelmed with all of these different options. But um, in an ideal world, um, we can kind of extend the education beyond just those three points. So oftentimes um, we need to take the time to really ask some questions to see exactly what the family's situation is and what their needs are for a booster seat. So here are some examples of things you might ask the caregiver to better understand their situation and be more effective at guiding them to a booster product that will work best for them. And these are just some examples to get started. I'm sure lots of you have other really great technician or really great questions in your toolkits uh, to help guide the conversation. So you might ask, you know, is you know the child that you're getting this booster for are they a new booster rider or are they an experienced booster rider? If, if this is going to be their first ever time in a booster, uh, you might want to keep in mind that a high back um, is typically a little bit better for a first timer because a high back booster can help keep the shoulder belt better aligned. And importantly, those side wings um, help to keep the child sitting up straight. So even if they fall asleep, they can lean against the side wings and still stay in a, a you know, mostly proper upright position and it's gonna have better odds of keeping that shoulder belt where it belongs. You might ask, are there typically other passengers next to the child? So this will give you some hints about, you know, how wide can the booster be without interfering with an adjacent seating position? If they're the only ones who ride in the back seat, maybe a big bulky booster is fine for them. If you're trying to fit three across, you know, those, those bigger boosters may not be the best option for that child. You might want to ask, will the booster stay in one vehicle or will it be moved around often? So again, going back to size, if it's going to stay in a, a vehicle and doesn't need to be taken in and out, you know, it can be a little bit bigger and heavier. Um, or, you know, if you're, they're going to be moving it around to different carpools or traveling a lot, uh, maybe a more portable booster would be more appropriate. Um, are they buying just one booster or multiple boosters for multiple different cars? So this is going to affect price point. You know, they're not going to want the most expensive booster if they have to buy three or four of them for mom's car, dad's car, grandma's car, babysitter's car, et cetera. Um, and on the same note, you know, will the booster be handed down to a younger sibling? So if, you know, they have another sibling coming that can maybe use the booster before it expires, they might get a little bit more bang for their buck um, and maybe want to spring for a higher price point. Um, or a younger sibling, you know, maybe you want to consider a combination seat that has a five-point harness if the younger sibling um, can, can benefit from that once the seat gets handed down. So asking questions like this can really give you a better idea um, about what type of booster to look for, or at least, you know, which features you can prioritize 
in terms of size or different you know modes available or price etc and then um, if a caregiver wants um, more specific advice on specific brands or models at that point um, it can be helpful to refer them to reliable evaluation uh, resources such as IAHS or consumer reports and they can kind of browse through some of the targeted types of products from there so Hopefully now um, you know a little bit more about how these different evaluation and rating programs work. And so this is a way that you can kind of supplement them um, or use them to supplement your own tailored guidance as a CPST. Um, you know, it, it's not hugely helpful to send an uneducated parent to IHS or Consumer Reports and say, oh, pick any of the best bets, you know, they're all good. But um, if you can kind of help them narrow down what type of booster and what things to look for, um, then, you know, if they're deciding between two or three different models, uh, the, the evaluation websites like these might um, offer a little bit um, more advice between those specific choices. So, like I mentioned, those resources have been around for a little bit um, and they're, they're pretty thoroughly vetted. And so I think they're important tools that um, technicians should know about and refer to as needed. Now, um, I'm going to move on and talk about some research that's really brand new. Um, it's actually still currently happening. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's being done and also, you know, how this work is continuing to push the envelope on our, our scientific knowledge. So we talked about um, some belt fit metrics such as shoulder belt score, lap belt score. Um, those types of things have been around and have been used for a while um, and to great success. They're, they're very valuable um, measurement metrics to use. Um, we have a new belt fit metric that uh, we are currently investigating in our lab at OSU. Um, this is being explored by our um, PhD student, Gretchen Baker. Gretchen um, is about to earn her PhD this spring, and she has spent the last several years um, investigating how the seat belt fits on the lower part of the torso of children seated in boosters. Um, so yeah, this, this has been years and years of work. When you get a PhD, you answer one very specific question, but you answer it in a whole lot of detail. Um, so this is what Gretchen has been working on. And if you look at the picture, um, you can see how the seat belt is kind of routing around the armrest of the booster, and it's creating a gap um, between the belt and the child's body. And she noticed this gap while she was looking at video footage of children in actual vehicles, in actual boosters, as they were being driven around a test track um, for a research study. And she started to wonder whether the presence or the size of this gap might affect how well the seatbelt can stay in place, um, both before a crash and during a crash. And the belt gap in this area of the torso is something that no one had ever really looked at um, or even fully quantified before. And so that has been um, her work for the past couple of years. So Gretchen, um, along with our team at OSU, recruited 50 different kids, ages four to 14, and we had them come sit on 10 different boosters in our lab. And she painstakingly measured hundreds and hundreds of different data points for each child on each booster. And she looked at where different anatomic landmarks were located in 3D space. She took measurements of how the belt um, fit on each child and whether there was any gap in the area that we talked about. She also had a really, really cool 3D system to record each child's posture. Um, it's called Xsense, and you basically stick sensors all over the child's body, and then the system creates this little 3D like robot avatar on the computer screen, and the kids could like jump around and like dance, and they would see their robot like do their dances on the screen. So it was really, really fun for them um, and fun for us as researchers too, let's be honest. Um, but in scientific terms, um, once they sat down in the booster, the, the 3D system was able to track the exact posture of the child as they sat for like the five or 10 minutes that they had to sit while we collected all of our data. And so we could see exactly how much they wiggled around during each session. Um, because we know, like I said, kids love to wiggle. So you kind of want to know uh, what they're doing at each point in time. Um, and then once we had all the child data, um, she repeated all of these same measurements for four different pediatric crash test dummies so that we could compare how the belt is fitting each dummy compared to real children. Here's kind of a closer look at the gap, the belt gap metrics that she looked at. So um, we've got the hybrid three fifth percentile female dummy as an example. This is a small adult um, female dummy that is sometimes used to represent a large child. Um, she's about the size of like an average 12, 13, 14 year old. Um, so um, what we did was measure the length of the gap along the belt 
and the corresponding um, percentage of the belt that was in contact with the torso versus not in contact. Um, and then at the top right photo, we're kind of looking at the side and she measured how large the gap was and how far forward the seat belt sat in front of the torso. And then in the bottom right picture, um, she recorded where the gap was located with respect to different landmarks, um, such as the suprasternal notch near the sternum and the asis on the pelvis. And here's just a few examples of some real children from this study. So the picture on the left um, shows this booster kind of pulling the seat belt a little bit further forward. Um, so you can see it kind of routing around the armrest. And then the photo on the right, um, this is kind of a unique type of booster that actually doesn't have an armrest. And so this design allows the belt to route directly on top of the torso all the way around. So we're just looking at very different booster designs. And, you know, these are all out there on the market. And we're just trying to understand, you know, what are some of these differences? Can we quantify exactly what's going on in these different products? And so, like I said, this work is still underway. Um, but some of the preliminary conclusions that I can share with you today are, um, as we saw, the belt gap varies based on different features on different boosters. This may seem a little obvious, um, but the advantage is that now we have some exact measurements and exact data to tell us exactly how much gap is created by different types of booster features. And also, you know, how that gap changes for children of different sizes and different ages. <clears throat> Excuse me. She also found that um, the pediatric crash test dummies on average tended to have larger belt gaps than real children. So the dummies were overestimating this gap. And this is important because, you know, we already know that crash test dummies are not perfect representations of children. And now we have very specific data about this one additional way that they seem to differ. So there's two publications of this work coming out um, in the fall, one from ERCOBE conference that just happened recently, and one in um, the journal Traffic Injury Prevention that will be released in October. And I'm happy to send you these citations um, if you're interested in learning more when those come out. Uh, one very important um, question on this topic of belt gap is, uh, does this belt gap affect crash safety? And the answer is we don't know yet. So I really wanna emphasize this because we don't fully understand how this belt gap affects actual children in crashes or how or even if it should be prioritized as something to check for. So. Um, we're currently doing some crash testing and trying to understand whether the belt gap actually affects anything. Maybe it will turn out that, you know, it is important, or maybe it will turn out that other factors play a larger role in crash outcomes. So maybe it's something we don't need to worry about or even consider. So again, every booster on the market today um, has passed a basic crash test, and they all currently have various amounts of belt gap. So this is just an example of how researchers are exploring um, above and beyond the current standards. So maybe we'll find something here to make boosters better in the future. Maybe this is a dead end and doesn't really make a difference. Um, but that's kind of how science works, right? We observe something that we think might matter and we make a hypothesis and we collect a whole bunch of data to see how and if that variable actually matters. So the bottom line that I'm getting here is don't panic if you see some belt gap on a child in a booster. Um, make sure that the general position of the belt is good over the center of the shoulder and the lap belt is fitting low on the hips and you know stick to these proven factors um, for now to examine when you're checking belt fit on a booster. Uh, the next new study I want to talk about is um, this one by Monica Jones et al up at the University of Michigan. Um, we're rivals with Michigan on the football field but I do have to admit that they do a lot of nice child safety research um, in this study, they looked at seat belt fit and posture in some slightly different ways um, than what we were looking at in our study at OSU. And full disclosure, um, I was not involved in this work. So today I am just presenting uh, what can be found in their publication that you see cited here. Um, and if you have you know, any deeper questions, um, I would invite you to reach out to the authors of this study because again, I was not involved in this work. All of um, what I'm presenting is available in the publication. So Jones et al. Um, measured posture and belt fit for 25 children ages 4 to 12 years old in a variety of boosters um, and different vehicle seat cushion lengths and belt geometries. Um, this is an example of a child in one of their test setups. And you can see that this is an example of poor fit and poor posture. The lap belt looks like it's crossing too high on the stomach. Um, it's not really anchored on the strong points of the pelvis. 
the shoulder belt looks like it uh, might be hitting her neck, although it's kind of hard to tell from this angle. And overall, this child um, looks a little bit slouched, like maybe the seat cushion is too long for her knees to comfortably clear the edge of the seat while sitting up straight. In this paper, um, they discuss a lot about how traditional boosters raise the head height of the child closer to that of an average adult. So um, here we see a child in a vehicle seat without a booster. Um, the head is maybe at this height. Uh, if we put that same child in a booster, um, the head can be raised up. Um, it essentially raises up, of course, whatever the height of the booster itself is. And that might be about the same level as an adult sitting in that same seat. So something that the researchers looked at in this study was how not all boosts are created equal. And that is, you know, some boosters raise children's seated height higher than others because some boosters are higher, like the part that the child sits on is thicker than others. Uh, the boosters in the Jones study had boost heights of approximately 45 to 177 millimeters, or about 1.8 to 7 inches. Um, however, some boosters on the market are even thinner than that. Um, some go um, potentially down to even like 10 millimeters thick, which is less than half an inch. And the authors of this study visualized this head height data by comparing it to a range of small to average adults. So here we've got all the different children in their study graphed um, by stature or standing height across the horizontal axis. And then each child sat in either no booster seat, which is the open pink circles, followed by each of the six boosters that they tested, um, which all had various boost heights um, in the orange, yellow, green, and, and blue colors. The height of each symbol on the graph is the head height of the child of that booster. And the dashed lines going across um, show the head height of the 50th percentile male on top, so an average sized male adult. And then the lower dashed line is that of the fifth percentile female, so a small adult female or kind of average teenager. And you can see that in the shorter boosters or the heightless boosters, uh, many of the children were not within this typical adult range. The taller boosters in green and blue um, did a better job of boosting them up closer to the average adult height. And again, you know, this is not rocket science that higher boosters make kids taller, but we need studies like this um, to document exactly what is happening so that we can figure out um, whether adjustments should be made. And just to kind of emphasize how important this head height is, um, let's take a look at some side airbags in vehicles. So, um, like I said, side airbags are designed and tested um, for adults specifically, but there's some evidence that children can still benefit from them. So here's an example of a side airbag. Um, and you can kind of see this is an adult um, dummy in the back seat. And you can see that the nice soft cushy part of the airbag is right at the adult's head. If you picture a child whose head might only be this height, you know, that child's head isn't really going to hit that airbag. It's going to hit maybe beneath the airbag um, down here on the door padding. And again, you know, the doors are padded a little bit, but that airbag is really designed um, to cushion the head. And so if we can boost the child up to that height, that child will benefit a little bit more than they would have if they missed that airbag. Here's another design of an airbag, and they're all a little bit different in different vehicles. Um, but you can see this one's nice, soft, cushy up here in the head area, and doesn't really offer a whole lot of protection down lower. Here's another design where the um, inflatable part kind of extends forward along the whole door, which is a little bit different, kind of nice. And then here's some examples um, where we might have a little bit more protection in the pelvis and the torso area um, in addition to the head. And so, you know, this is something um, that might protect the child a little bit more. But also keep in mind that, you know, this bag is designed for an adult torso, it is not designed for a child's head. And so um, the ways that it's shaped and the ways that it inflates and deploys might be a little bit different. And so um, boosting that child up uh, closer to the height of the adult for whom this was designed might allow the child to get the full benefit. So again, side curtain airbags in the rear row appear to be beneficial um, for properly restrained children in side impacts. You might be asking, well, you know, a lot of boosters and CRSs have side wings on them. So, you know, is that child, you know, well protected by those side wings? Do they even need the airbags in addition? Um, to that, I would say that the side wings on CRSs are only moderately effective at um, protecting the heads. Um, they work the best in side impacts that are purely lateral. Um, so if your car was completely stopped and just got kind of T-boned by another car coming in from the side, um, that's where the side wings appear to be most effective. But 
most real world crashes don't happen like that. Typically, the car that's being struck is moving forward at least a little bit. And that forward motion kind of causes the head to swing kind of forward out and around um, the, side, the side wings of the CRS or the booster like you can see in the photo. So certainly side wings, you know, they appear to help in some cases. Um, they certainly help just keeping the child positioned during normal driving. If a child is squirmy or falls asleep, you know, having those side wings is nice to kind of keep them upright during normal driving. Um, but, you know, certainly having those airbags is another layer of protection for their head. And of course, backless bo boosters don't have side wings at all. And so they're kind of entirely relying um, on the safety features of the vehicle to protect the child in a side impact. So some other factors to consider um, is that, you know, side curtain airbags only help in near side impacts only, and it's not really applicable for far side or center seated children. So the height of the booster um, might not matter so much in those cases. So, you know, I'm not saying that you should go out and buy the absolute tallest, highest booster that you can find for every kid, because there might be some different implications if that child is seated in a different um, position in the vehicle or is in a different type of crash. So near side collisions, side airbag curtains tend to help children if they're boosted up high enough. But again, boosting the child up all the way to the ceiling um, isn't necessarily the solution either. So I just wanted to kind of clarify, <clears throat> excuse me, clarify that point before we move on um, that, you know, not every child needs the absolute tallest booster available. Um, in addition to height, the Jones study also looked at how boosters help children fit better lengthwise on the vehicle seat. So they found that low height boosters um, tended to produce postures that were a little bit more slouched um, with the hips further forward than in more typical boosters. And if you look at the little drawing of what's happening here, you can see that when the thigh of the child is too short for their knees to clear the edge of the vehicle seat comfortably, they tend to scoot forward on the seat and then slouch back into a more comfortable position. Um, this is a little bit more natural um, than to, for them to sit back with their feet kind of sticking straight out in front of them. And in fact, most booster occupants probably couldn't sit like that in the back seat because their feet would hit the back of the front row seat. So um, the way to, to fix this is um, to give them a booster that effectively shortens um, the length of their seating surface. And so the photo on the right shows that you know that booster is a little bit shorter than the actual vehicle seat and it allows them to comfortably bend their knees over the edge of the booster in a way that doesn't require them to slouch forward. Also, um, if we add the seat belt into the drawings, um, you can see that the slouch position causes the seat belt to route more horizontally, which increases the chance of submarining. They can just kind of slide right under that belt and the belt is more um, more likely to ride up into the stomach instead of anchoring low on the hips. Um, on the other hand, on the right side, boosting the child up routes the seatbelt more vertically, and this helps the seatbelt kind of pull down and, and stay low on the hips and thighs, even, even when the child is propelled forward during the crash. So um, what can you as technicians do with this information? So we've already discussed that improving belt fit is the most obvious and critical role of a booster. Remember those checkpoints at the shoulder and the hips. But going a step further, further child's posture in the booster is also really important um, from a crash standpoint. The boosted height of the child's head along with their leg length um, compared to the length of the booster are both important to give them an optimal position with respect to the seatbelt and the airbags in the event of a crash. There are also some practical considerations here, uh, namely the comfort of the child. Like we mentioned, you know, the, the child in a vehicle seat or a booster that doesn't fit them right won't be comfortable and they just won't be able to stay in that ideal position for very long. So at this point, maybe you're asking yourself, um, you know, what about all these low height or heightless boosters that we're seeing on the market? Um, you know, inherently by their design, they don't um, boost the child up to fit into the seat belt, but rather they pull the belt down to position it over the child. And since there's no boost, um, they don't raise the height of the child's head, at least not significantly so. And so we might be missing out um, on some of the protection of certain side airbag designs. Um, heightless boosters also don't really shorten the length of the vehicle seat. So some kids are more tempted to slouch in them unless you know maybe they can find another comfortable alternative like crossing their legs 
um, to, to kind of stay upright. So these are some of the conclusions um, that we can make just by looking at um, the basic design of these boosters. But that being said, there might be some scenarios where a low height booster might be the best option or the only practical option. Like if a family is traveling by plane and needs a compact or portable booster at their destination, or maybe a carpool where you need to fit three children across in the rear row. These situations do exist. And so on this topic, um, I encourage you as CPSTs to exercise um, your good, better, best mindset. So a heightless booster uh, may not be the best option for normal everyday travel for a child, um, but there might be situations where um, it's still a good option, even, you know, especially if there's no alternative I'm sorry, especially if the alternative is no booster at all. So, you know, typically we want the child in the best booster, the best option, but if there's a good solution that still follows all the manufacturer's instructions, um, sometimes that, you know, sometimes it's our job as technicians um, to encourage parents towards that option. And there's a really nice um, write-up actually about good, better, best in the CPS Express uh, newsletter that just came out yesterday. So that was good timing here, a good little reminder. One more point um, as we wrap up this section is that I wanna reiterate clearly that um, boosters and all CRS really, um, they work in harmony with the vehicle environment. So safety products don't exist in a vacuum. I don't know about you, um, I personally love going into the car seat aisle at like Target or Walmart and I look at all the new products and I play with all the new features and I call my husband over and I say, oh my gosh, look at this, this is so cool. And he kind of says, yeah, honey, that's cool, that's great. Um, but anyway, um, you know, we, we love to look at, at all these, this really cool new technology and car seats and boosters, but we need to remember that, you know, that's only part of the story. And we, as a community, we need to consider how each of these products and features works alongside all of the technology um, that's built into the vehicles. And also um, how all of this technology works for different children of various sizes and different maturity levels. And it's a job that, you know, manufacturers, researchers, CPSTs, and caregivers all need to do. And each of these groups of people are experts in different bits of information that all need to come together. So the CRS manufacturers, they know their products inside and out. And the vehicle manufacturers know their products inside and out. Um, but it's also really important that these different groups communicate with each other to ensure that the whole system is working together. Caregivers are obviously, you know, the experts on their own children but they might not have the technical knowledge to navigate some of these topics. And so I think that CPSTs are in a really important position here because, you know, you guys work directly in the crossroads of all of these pieces coming together. You know, you are curbside with caregivers trying to fit together their CRS into their vehicle with their child. And so I really applaud you guys. Um, it's a challenging job being kind of the glue that kind of bridges all of these things together. And so a couple of points on that note are um, don't be afraid to seek help when you need it. So caregiver, or I'm sorry, CPSCs have a really big job and you don't need to know all of the information out there off the top of your head, but you should know where to find it and where to learn it. So use those instruction manuals, use those manufacturers websites, call the manufacturers helplines if something isn't clear, um, you know, use your latch manual. These are all great resources um, to find the information um, that applies to every scenario. And also um, speak up about problems because, you know, if you're out there doing a seat check and come across something kind of weird or something that doesn't work together, the manufacturers and the researchers can't fix a problem that they don't know exists. And so don't be afraid to, you know, call in the, to those manufacturers and say, hey, you know, I found this weird thing that was going on. You know, are you guys aware of this? And, you know, give them that information so that they can kind of take it under wing and, and look into some details. Okay, um, I have a last section on crash testing. I'm gonna go through this quickly because we're running short on time, but I just wanted to introduce um, a few other studies that have come out recently looking at um, crash testing results of boosters. Um, there was another one up at University of Michigan, this one by, um, led by Klinich et al, where they looked at um, some different dynamic metrics to maybe differentiate how different boosters are performing. And again, I was not involved in this work, but. Briefly, um, booster crash testing is done on a standardized test bench, and there are four main criteria that are um, each booster needs to pass in order to pass the, the overall crash test. 
they look at head excursion and knee excursion. So how far the head and the knee are moving forward um, from a reference point on the bench. They look at head injury criterion or HIC, which is um, a version of head acceleration and how fast the head is moving. And they look at chest acceleration and how fast the chest is moving um, during the crash. These are the traditional metrics. Um, the new metrics that um, Clinich et al. Um, are proposing might be a little bit more detailed and tell us a little bit more information. Um, they're suggesting that we look at, rather than head and knee separately, um, they found that looking at the difference between knee and head excursion was helpful in combination with the maximum torso angle. And um, these angles are helpful because you want the dummy to kind of lean forward a little bit, lean forward into the um, seat belt. If you see the dummy in too reclined of a position during a crash, that can indicate that the dummy is kind of sliding underneath the lap belt and could be a problem. And so they um, um, suggest that these two metrics can be really valuable in um, looking at the position of the dummy and making sure that they're not sliding under the lap belt. They also suggest looking at lumbar spine force um, in the lateral dire direction and lumbar spine torsion or twist. So what's happening kind of internally in the dummy um, in the lumbar spine area can tell us some information about how effective that booster is. Um, and then lastly, um, just briefly a study um, that I led at OSU, um, which is being published in about a month, um, is the evaluation of latch versus non-latch installations for boosters, um, specifically in frontal impacts. And so we know that most boosters on the US market have two acceptable installation methods. Um, you can install them with the latch system, which um, typically includes the lower anchors and sometimes a top tether for boosters, um, always a top tether for harnessed seats, but the top tether in boosters is sometimes um, not present or optional. And then you can also install a booster in a non-latch method. So you just place the booster on the seat and buckle the seat belt over the booster and the occupant. Um, there's some you know, benefits, obvious benefits to using latch because it stabilizes the booster during entry and exit. It prevents the unused booster from becoming a projectile. And um, we have a hypothesis that it might also control the weight of the booster and the mass of the booster um, from kind of pushing against the child's back during the crash. If you can kind of secure the booster itself, then it's not adding extra weight um, to the movement of a child in a crash. But we do have some potential disadvantages of using latch. Um, namely, there was one study that found that the occupant um, might decouple from the booster. So the occupant kind of keeps moving forward into the seat belt, but the booster is latched in place. And then um, in this particular test under these particular conditions, the booster slipped or the child slipped off the front edge of the booster. And so we wanted to investigate this a little more closely. We did 16 tests with a variety of different high back and backless boosters. Each one was installed either with the latch system or without. We did our testing on late model year vehicle seats with real seat belts and with real retractors. We used a um, six year old crash test dummy. Um, the frontal impact was that of um, pretty close to the um, regulatory standard frontal impact, about 31 miles per hour. Um, here's some videos of what happened. So just some examples. The top video is a non-latch installation. So the booster is just placed on the seat. The bottom video is latched with lower anchor and top tether. Visually, um, these tests look very similar. If we take some freeze frames, um, this is initial position, and then this is point of maximum excursion. You see um, the results are very similar. The head um, travels pretty much the same amount, whether the booster is installed with latch or not. The booster itself um, moves a little bit more when it's not latched in and a little bit less when it is latched in. Again, um, pretty much what you would expect. Um, we calculated all these. I'm not going to sit through these too much, but suffice it to say that um, pretty much the boosters responded very similarly, whether they were installed with latch or without latch. Um, using the top tether did appear to reduce the seat belt load in some cases, um, specifically for the high back boosters with the top tether, um, but it wasn't super significant in um, reducing forces to the chest. And so our conclusions here, um, we didn't see any major red flags um, in any of our tests, which is great. So um, that implies that um, you know the the current recommendations of optional latch usage um, you know 
appear to be fine. Um, you know, kind of whatever is easier for the caregiver and more convenient for their situation. Um, from a crash testing standpoint, they appear um, to, to react very similarly. But of course, there are some limitations in only looking at six boosters, one vehicle seat, and we only looked at frontal impacts here. So we're hoping to get some more information um, on different types of impacts in the future. Um, so overall, these are my final slides. We're wrapping things up here, coming in hot. Um, boosters should provide good lap belt fit, good shoulder belt fit, good posture um, for children because this allows children to benefit from those adult safety features that we see in vehicles. And um, along with this, they should provide a comfortable environment because a comfortable child is going to be a child that stays in the proper position during the entire ride. So hopefully some of these studies that um, we talked through today show you how researchers and manufacturers are always searching um, for ways to improve the current state of the art. Um, but as technicians, always remember good, better, best, you know, get that child in the best booster they can with the best fit possible. Um, but remember, as long as you're following manufacturers instructions, you're doing a good job as a tech. You're doing actually a great job as a tech. If you can get um, every child um, in a booster um, in some sort of safety device that offers them some protection and is being used properly. So here are my main references. I'm happy to send you anything um, that you're interested in learning about. And I'm all done, all through my slides. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, if anyone wants to hang around for some questions and answers, um, I'm happy to chat through any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Very interesting. And I, I love how you you combine the research along with the the tips for technicians and you know the the issues that are really very important to parents too that we have to continually think about. We did have a few questions. Um, two of them were concerning um, booster fit in cars and the vehicles due to the head restraint, like pushing the high back boosters out, causing a gap, um, and so that it doesn't seem like the the high back booster is fitting the vehicle very well and you know is that gap a problem it seems like the manufacturers say different things about that the manufacturers do say different things about that and um that is one of the things that you just have to defer to the manufacturer um myself as a researcher you know i, I haven't tested every booster out there i don't know um that gap could affect some boosters differently than others um and so yeah go by the manufacturer's guidelines on that um, you know, sometimes it's helpful. Um, I, I have found personally that sometimes combination seats fit a little bit better, especially the ones that um, have the adjustable head support um, kind of within the main shell. So sometimes you can get the main shell of that combination seat to fit underneath the head restraint and flush with the vehicle seat back. And then the head support just kind of goes up and down in front of the um, head restraint, whereas sometimes the dedicated high back boosters tend to be kind of flat all the way up the back. And so those ones, they're more flexible, but sometimes just the shape of them isn't as accommodating. So again, um, you know, it's kind of a, a situation by situation thing. Um, I, I don't know of any specific data looking at that question. And, and I would just defer to the manufacturers um, to know what works best for their products and, and to follow those guidelines. Thanks. Sounds like a another uh, doctoral student's um, research project, huh? Yeah. Um, had, yeah. Do we, we had another question that um, I think you addressed a little bit, but maybe you can say more. The question was, do you think frontal crash testing is a good measurement of safety in boosters? It seems that crash rotation may lead to real world injuries, lack of containment in booster seats. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, frontal impacts are, kind of the basic test that we do because most crashes have a frontal component, you know, cars move forward. So at least one car in every crash is going to be moving forward and experiencing a frontal impact. And so just based on the numbers, you're more likely to be in a frontal impact than any other type of crash. Um, that being said, um, you're absolutely right. The, the side components um, do cause injuries. Side impacts are proportionally more injurious than frontal, um, partly just because they've been studied less. Um, and partly just you've got higher forces coming in through the door. So um, there are side impact test standards being developed for harnessed car seats. So for rear facing and forward facing harnessed seats, um, boosters and side impacts. Again, it's, it's really complicated to develop a 
test specifically for boosters because boosters rely so much on the vehicle safety features. And so, you know, a side impact test for booster, maybe you need to include some sort of side curtain airbag. Maybe you need to look more at, you know, how the head is being contained versus not. And so there's a lot of really interesting things we could look at in side impacts and it's a complicated question. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, yeah, someday we can improve our testing standards and include something um, for boosters and side impacts or any seat and side impacts or with side components. Um, we're not quite there yet. It, it's going to be a long discussion and, and kind of a long development. Okay, thank you. If you're an EMS clinician and you want to receive a Maryland EMS credit, send me uh, your name and your provider number to the email below, cps at mims.org, and I'd be happy to um, get you that credit. If you need a, a certificate of participation for whatever reason for attending this, let me know. Just send me a, a an email and I will get that to you. So that's, I think that's everything. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Mansfield, for your very interesting talk. And I think we will uh, be expecting you back in a couple of years to hear some more. Sounds great. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, everyone.